Well, we are all gathered here on Mother's Day with memories and with a restatement of our affections, regards, and admirations for our parents, especially the mothers who went through the mystery and the misery of bringing us forth. It seems, therefore, that it might be interesting to study one of the most curious circumstances in religion, and that is the relationship of the feminine principle to the principal basic theologies that have descended to us from antiquity. I think we may point out with some uh, assurance that the purely masculine concept of deity is comparatively recent. In other words, most of the religions of antiquity had an entirely different attitude toward the invisible spiritual worlds and realities behind physical existence. Nearly all of the ancient religions of the world were more or less religions of family. In other words, the deities were more or less inspired by the earthly social structure the brood family, the tribe, the emerging society was always the basis of a spiritual conviction. In other words, the earthly family, the basic family pattern, the Pythagorean 47th proposition, is father, mother, child. This was the original trinity and has been uh, so recognized for many thousands of years. In the mathematical formula of the Pythagorean equation, the square of three plus the square of four equals the square of five. Three father, four mother, five child. This concept has been sustained mathematically by philosophy for thousands of years. How then do we uh, want to understand some of the points that have come up in the uh, course of human change and evolution. Nearly all our religious thinking has been more or less rarefied to become the basis of our spiritual convictions. Society, more or less, regards itself as a symbolic unit, and this society has been extended upward to become the basis of a divine society. And the divine society of antiquity was merely a very rarefied version of human society. In the heavenly regions of the past, everything was based upon a family. It was not based upon a single deity. It was based upon gods and godlings and goddesses that were very human because they were based upon human archetypes. We find that the gods of antiquity had all kinds of problems. They had everything that we have on earth. They had the jealousies, they had the wars, the conflicts, the conspiracies that we associate with humankind. And these various problems became the basis of a concept of reality, a concept of reality in which the entire system of divinities was parental. The gods were the parents of mankind. These gods to become parents had to be parents. And each parent god in one way or another, uh, each deity, male and female, became parental as the fathers and mothers of mortals. The savior deities were the eldest sons of this parental family. The lesser divinities were some of them derived from uh, the subordinate religions. Some were merely an examination into the theory of relationships, uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters, children. But heaven was a family, and it was a family for thousands of years, and as such was almost completely dominant among the religions of the world. This family of deity, this father, mother, child, became heaven, earth, and the underworld. It became the great triad. 
of will, wisdom, and action. It became another great triad of wisdom, love, and service. Everywhere things were tri triadic, and the deities involved had equal rights and privileges and received appropriate venerations. It is interesting to note, even now, that throughout the religious world, there are very few sanctuaries dedicated primarily to God the Father. We have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit, we have the saints of all denominations, but it is very rare, even in other religions, to find a sanctuary uh, that is completely masculine, the exception principally being the Muslim faith. This uh, idea of the parental pattern goes back to the brood family, the original primitive unit of human existence. The brood family goes back to the cave dwellers. It goes back as far as we can find a scratching on the wall of a cave. Everywhere the brood family was the ruler. And in every brood family the mother was the leader. Our American Indians have exactly the same concepts. It was the same concept in Central and South America. It was the same in Egypt. And in most of the religions of the ancient world, the brood family descended on the side of the mother. In Egypt, the mother was the one who named, designated, and served as the ruler of the ruler. In the Egyptian philosophy, Isis and Osiris, brother and sister, were rulers of the other world, and brothers and sisters ruled the material world. Everywhere this rulership was divided, but not in a sense of conflict, but because it was a family. And unless there was the male and female principle, they could not be the progeny. And in ancient times, the progeny itself was humanity. Now, this kind of thinking some way got out of line and has gradually disappeared in the popular worships of the modern world. It is, however, still to be found in a number of localities. One of the most interesting examples, of course, has been the descent of the concept of the solar deity. The sun god has usually been figured as male. But we still have one exception to that rule. About 60 or 65 million Shintos in Japan worship Amaterasu Omikami, the goddess of the sun. The sun is feminine in that religion. All over the world, the family pattern, however, has continued to influence the thinking of mankind. Here in society, we are struggling for a certain sense of equality to overcome prejudices and opinions. And if we go back to the ancient way of things, we will realize that the world as a family was governed by a hierarchy as a family. Now, this point is very clearly indicated in the writings of Confucius the great Chinese uh, sage. He explained that the human family, the parents and children, was the primary unit of human society. Everything came from that. In the material world, the individual family was the basis of the entire study of world populations, nations, races, and countries. After that, Confucius explained, first duty of mankind is to put the family in order. If the family is not in order, civilization will not endure. The family means compatibility, unity of effort, self-sacrifice if need arises, devotion, integrity, and loyalty. Unless these exist, the child will not become a superior person. The whole moral life of society is by example of the family. Children rule themselves because they follow the guidance of the family. When there is an emergency, the family stays together. And in ancient times, there was no inequality in the family. Each had their particular function 
each was entitled to equal respect, honor, and recognition. Confucius then pointed out that when the family is completely integrated, when the family has found complete loyalty, a loyalty, however, which is not exclusive, a loyalty which, however, governs the family inwardly towards its own roots, that when this has been achieved, then the community can be considered. The community is also a family. It is a family of families. The community must be put in order. If there are 50 families, these must work together, respect each other, regard each other, honor each other, and understand each other. If the community is considered a unit, and that unit is harmonious, then we come to the great city, which is made up of hundreds of families, thousands of them. But until the personal family and the community family have been rectified, the family of the great city cannot be rectified. There is no way of forcing upon the greater that which has not been bestowed upon the lesser. There is no way in which a great city can survive if the individual families have not been rectified. If the city is, be, is rectified, all of those working and living in it consider themselves as one family. This family may be made up of many levels, layers, and conditions, but it is still a unit. And it is a unit that must cooperate, must honor, must rectify relationships so that the community dwells in peace and honor and various evils which are now rampant would no longer exist. From the great city comes the country, and the country is made up of many cities, and these cities are made up of many families, but the, the country is one. And unless all these lesser parts have been rectified, the country is in disorder. And if the country is in disorder, all the smaller units are troubled, as well as the progression of the country into the future. There can be no security in a nation unless its families, its homes, and its communities dwell together in honorable relationships. And if these honorable relationships are rectified, the nation or the country is well governed. And if the country is well governed and each country likewise rectified, the world abides in peace and all nations and all peoples are safe and there can be no further strife, no ambitions to destroy any more than a parent would want to destroy its own children. So after the world has been so rectified, there is one step further. And that one step further is to realize that this is an archetypal plan, a program that has existed before the beginning of time. And that above the rectified world is the region of the supreme family, that family which we call the Godhead, a family in which all virtues are exemplified in which all rules and laws are imagined to exist. And in this divine family, there can be no prejudice, there can be no corruption of lesser peoples or plans, there can be no ambitions, and only a great good family. But this great good family is invisible. And this great good family is beyond the estimation of the human mind in all of its patterns. Therefore, this great family is interpreted by human beings according to their own families. And if the families on earth are in friction and are dishonorable, then the gods in heaven are said to be suffering from conspiracies. If there are griefs and grievances among the gods, it is because man in his own image has created their likenesses and bestowed upon them his own fra frailties and limitations. But actually, in the concept as it is, uh, Buddha summarized the statement by saying that creation itself is a great commune. It is a commonwealth. It is a tremendous diversity within unity. It is the supreme achievement of supreme divine insights. It has been placed here 
and developed, governed, and ruled by the highest conceivable systems of ethics. And the human being is not capable in all cases of fully appreciating this or accepting it or understanding it. But it still remains, as Confucius pointed out, the supreme law, the supreme plan, the, the supreme symbol, and the ordered universe is the symbol of the divine power. Now this divine power must manifest in many ways. It manifests on earth, it manifests in the heavens, it manifests in the smallest insect, in the minerals, in the plants, in all creatures. There are laws regarding existence. And these laws are absolutely equal, fair to all concerned, with no prejudice and no preferences, all things measured by integrities alone. And these integrities are the innate truths that were planted therein by the divine power in the fashioning of all things. So in the beginning we have a whole series of myths, great legends having to do with creation. And these legends are, are still uh, very largely dominant in our thinking, even though we have transformed them into myths or symbols or emblems of power. The Egyptians, for example, uh, had a series of triads. These triads were distributed through the gnomes or provinces of Egypt. But in substance and essence, all of these groups of deities were a family. They were always father, mother, child. And in the most famous of these triads, uh, which came in in the middle and later dynasties of Egypt, the great tri triad was Osiris, Isis, and uh, Horus. Uh, Horus was the beloved son, the symbol of enlightened humankind, and the intercessor. Also, Horus, as he grew up to manhood, became the defender of his parents. He guarded them. He took care of them. He interceded for the weaknesses of mankind. And before the throne of Osiris and Isis, uh, the soul of the deceased was weighed to judge its virtues and its debilities. Isis was called the Mother of Mysteries. She was the leader of all the sacred arts. She was the leader of the initiation rites. She was the symbol, therefore, of the universal mother, the mysteries themselves. The temple was the symbol of the mother of mysteries. And all of those in Egypt who entered into the religions, and that involved practically the entire population, each one of them was the son of Isis. Each one regarded Isis as the great mother of mysteries. And uh, she was the instructor, the informer, the savior, and the preserver. Most of all, she practiced the most supreme power in Egypt, Egyptian philosophy, love. Because after all wisdom, after all strength, the great power of salvation lies in love. Love is what the parental family way up above uh, regards as the proper instrument of relationship between the deities and their human creatures and their animals and their birds and everything. So love was the great motion. Love was the great cohesive. Love was the basis of all morality, all growth, all security, all sanctity, and the protection of values. Therefore, they were all invested in Isis, the mother of mysteries. In the Phrygian rite, she was the psychopompus, the mysterious being that was dressed in the uh, raiment and in the ceremonial robes now associated with the pontiff of Rome. The supreme power in Egypt then was Isis, and uh, she became the symbol of all that was good and important. Her son became the savior of the world. And uh, in the great rites at Sais, in the lost and forgotten temple in Egypt, the initiations were in front of her altar. And in the final as case of the example of perfect wisdom, the veil of Isis was raised, 
and the initiate saw the image face to face. Now this was the way Egypt lived for thousands of years because it was necessary and important that the graces of life should perfect the strength. Strength was important but useless if not motivated by love. And love was useless unless it was in kinship and relationship with reason and wisdom. Therefore, in most of these philosophies, the God of wisdom and the goddess of mercy were the actual rulers of humanity. This brings us into another kind of relationship. In Greece, in the early, early days, there was no distinction, no peculiar emphasis upon the masculine as the symbol of all good. Uh, Zeus, or Jupiter, as he became in the Latin, was a uh, kind of good-natured rascal, but not too much to be counted on. The great wisdom of Egypt, of Egypt was in Isis. The great wisdom of Greece was in uh, the mysteries of Athena, uh, Pallas Athena, the supreme power in Grecian culture. Athena was born from the head of Zeus. He was she was born by Vulcan, the god of fire, splitting the head of the supreme god and bringing forth Athena armed and helmed. She has therefore been referred to, rather facetiously, as the great headache of Zeus. <laughs> but Athena was the mind. Athena was the <clears throat> intellect. Athena was the reason. And all of these were feminine attributes. Even wisdom, which was the keynote of Athena, was a completely, completely feminine factor. Because true wisdom has to be built upon internal intuition. It has to arise from a communion between the individual and the divine power, a communion of love, service, and common understanding. Athena, therefore, armed, became the guardian of almost every important art and science. If it was necessary, by one reason or another, she de became the defender of the faith. More likely, however, she was engaged in the arts. She was the goddess of schooling and education. She was the goddess of art and music and literature. She was the goddess of, of judgment and of law and of medicine. The great salvation of all things was entrusted to her because she was recognized as the actual manifestation of the divine power of Uranus and Cronus, the great gods of infinity. She was their product, born from them and of them, and everything that was good in nature was embodied in her by embodiment. So Athena not only became the guardian of many different arts and sciences, but she became the peculiar symbol of the International Bible Institute and is found on practically all of the publications and writings of this group. She is also the Britannia of England, the Columbia of the United States. She is the, on the seal of the state of California, and she is found in all parts of the world as a mysterious sovereignty, a sovereignty of integrities and values. This uh, goddess, therefore, became the Minerva of the Latins. And the Minerva of the Latins was, bestow was given a particular instrument, a helmet. A helmet which, whenever she closed the visor of it, she became invisible. Therefore, she became the patron of secret societies and esoteric religions. It was always in her name. Uh, Zeus might be wandering about the earth on worldly affairs, but she was the guardian of the home, of life, of family, and of growth and integrity, nutrition, and uh, internal wisdom, and, of course, of compassion. Now, in the Orient, we have a somewhat similar situation arise in connection with the esoteric teachings there. We find that Mahamaya, the mother of Buddha, holds a peculiar position in the Eastern thinking. She died five days after the child was born. 
and uh, therefore does not play an important part in the general theology of Buddhism, only in certain respects. Actually, she became embodied in the symbol of the peacock for the reason that the peacock was the devourer of serpents. And this was a very important symbol to the Eastern mind. And you will find that in a number of the symbols of the Immaculate Conception in uh, European art, the Virgin stands with her foot upon a serpent's head. She is the overcomer of serpents or of evil. One of the most interesting symbols in Buddhism is, of course, that after Buddha's death, uh, the body was placed in a magnificent wooden casket the way in which it was usually it was usual to deposit bodies prior to cremation. And Mahamaya, the mother, came down from heaven to mourn for her son. And as she stood one morning for him, the casket opened and he rose from the dead to comfort her. And she joined him in the worlds beyond. And this is that legend, but it shows where the interest lies. Also in all Buddhism now, the northern school, Kannan, the Bodhisattva of, it, of compassion, is shown as feminine. Actually, she is represented as the mother again of all the good, all the wise, and all the noble. She is the one who brings the little lotus throne into the dying, uh, to the dying Buddhist and his soul is placed upon this lotus throne and carried to the other world. She is the intercessor for souls, the marvelous mother guardian of all orphans in any part of the world. Wherever a child is motherless, Kannan takes it for itself. These symbols go everywhere. Now, among the American Indians, we have some very interesting parallels to this. We find that in the Indian system, the brood family is the unit of culture and unit of civilization. Whether it be one of these uh, tribes that wandered about in the plains and throughout the country, or those more permanently located in the pueblos of the southwest, the brood family was always run in the same way. And the highest expression of it that we have come to, has come down to us was the great League of the Iroquois. The Iroquois League, or the first original and natural League of Nations, was the one that inspired Woodrow Wilson to attempt the creation of a League of Nations in the 20th century. But the League, the Great League of the Nations of the Iroquois, uh, was a unit built for the glory of truth. And the building, the place where they met, was called the Long House. And the long house was the one which was big enough to carry within it every living thing. It was the great house where all things lived in the one community relationship of family. Now, their various leagues had a political system that was so interesting that early in the development of it, uh, Shachems, or wise men from the Indian tribes, went to England at the request of the British government to explain their system of, pol of politics. And it was very, very simple. Each of the several tribes had its own senators, or congressmen, whatever you want to call them. They were the ones that became the representatives of the tribe. These congressmen, or senators, were elected and the only members of the tribe that could elect them or vote was women. The men could not vote. They appointed the men, but they could not vote. Therefore, the sachems, as they were called, uh, the uh, senators, uh, also then came to certain realizations and certain responsibilities which were unavoidable and inevitable and had to be completely uh, obeyed and recognized. These uh, sachems, each representing his tribe, had a limitation upon them. They could vote on any subject that did not relate to their own tribe. They could not vote for their own tribe. 
This was an interesting peculiarity that had rather long-range potentials. There could be no possibility, therefore, of them favoring their own tribe. They could not vote for it. If anything happened and the senator was unsuitable, the women recalled him and elected another one. But he had to pass through this type of election. In meeting, when the great tribe came together, the many tribes as one nation, the six nations, when they gathered together, they elected a chairman. And the chairman said at the front night, the door is open. The door being open meant that any subject or matter of importance could be discussed. All matters of importance had to be discussed in perfect calmness. No member of the, com of the group could say an unkind word about any other member. They had to say what they thought was necessary, but not attack anyone else in the saying of it. There could be no riots, there could be no arguments, there could be no filibusters. Each one presented his point, it was considered by the others, and as considered correctly, was passed, otherwise not passed. And then when the, con the matter was concluded and the session came to an end, the chairman said, the door is closed. And that was the end of the discussion. This is the way the Indians handled the matter. Today we have in the Pueblos some very interesting rules. And these rules include the voting and the living back and forth across the buildings. In most Pueblos there are two buildings, the men's house and the woman's house. Always they had to be marriage across the Pueblo, never within it. Members of one family could not intermarry. This was very, very ancient. And practically every one of these uh, groups, the women were the prophetesses. They were the modern descendants of the Sibyls, the women of prophetic antiquity, of the Vestal Virgins, who were the guardians of the light of Rome. They were also the uh, proprietors and leaders of the oracles, such as the Delphian oracle. In every case, the com communion with the gods was through women, not through the men. The men got the message, but the women were the ones who went into the trances, who prayed, and who sat in the fumes of the oracle. So that it is a very interesting way of looking at a world problem that in some mysterious way uh, the ancients seem to have been much wiser than we are in a great many matters. Also, I think it is well to bear in mind that in the early uh, development of social uh, society here, uh, the human beings making up our social structure gradually became uh, where we are separated from their religious principles. Now the religious principles that we have today are identical with those of antiquity. They are the same truth so which there can be no escape. But even now with what we understand or try to understand we cannot keep the peace. We are unable to practice the principles and integrities that have descended to us. And we went from an antiquity which it's, with its very important equalities, with its tremendous emphasis upon intangibles, the victory of the invisible over the visible in every case, and the realization that the great truths flowed down from causes unknown and unseen. We know these things, but we can't live them. Therefore, today we have a theology that is again based upon our sociology. We have a theology in which the uh, ambitions take precedence over principles, wealth over integrity, and uh, material power over spiritual in, uh, values and life principles. So as just surely as the ancient world had its concept of the family our modern world, more or less, has the concept of the family feud.
we have inherited the complete feudal structure. And in order to prove that it was inevitable, we set up a war in heaven to make sure the same thing happened there. <laughs> but we have no proof that this happened. We have only psychological convictions about it. The truth of the matter seems to be that we have merely shadowed our own uh, shortcomings uh, into space and made them seem to be divine laws. Actually, this is not the case. This is not real, but we have allowed it to become the common expression of our way, way of life. So in almost all parts of the world, we know that we dealt with a unified family divine power, that the integrities were of several natures. There were integrities of the mind, integrities of the heart, and integrities of labor and common works. All these have to work together. And uh, Comenius, the founder of the public school system, stated clearly and definitely that progress depended upon the education of the young and that the education of the young to have any value must be acquired, built in, and perfected before the child goes to school. That leaves pretty much a key as to where it has to come from. The child has to learn from love and not from education as we know it. It has to experience principles, and it experiences them by living in the midst of them. This is why Confucius was so anxious to perfect the family, because with the family perfected, the generations go on one after another until the end of time. But with each family protecting the integrities of its young, society grows and perfects itself as a total. This is also clearly referred to by Mencius in his Doctrine of the Mean and his tremendous respect for his own mother and the disciplines which his mother gave him. So everywhere we have this uh, ancient recognition that there has to be a unit in society that works together and that this unit has no superiorities and no inferiorities. It merely represents the manifestations of the principal processes of divine existence. In ancient times, there was very little of what we know as today as class consciousness. And even now, we realize as we go backward culturally, and we can do this in our present generation, as we drop back into the earlier centuries in the presence of emerging countries and those that have not emerged, we realize that the further back we go, even in modern society, the more equality there is. Inequality is a modern fashion. It is something that has come up when the individual felt that he could afford to disregard a large part of his own structure. But back in the older and lower areas of culture, men, women, and children work together on equal terms, each doing what is necessary to the preservation of society. Gradually, we have changed this pattern but as we have changed it, things have come, become consistently worse. We are not advancing the way we should. I think the time is very much at hand when we will have to realize that God is not a bachelor, that he is not something all by himself, that God represents a symbol, and that divine symbol is actually what we call in Christianity a trinity. It is three in one, one in three. And deity as a trinity is father, mother, child, a basic principle. It is the creator, the preserver, and the redeemer. It is the actual family itself with wisdom, love, and labor united in an absolutely indissolvable unity. If we can begin to think of this type of thing, it will do a great deal to help to release the individual from a condition that has gradually intensified in recent centuries, a, a condition unknown to antiquity. 
a condition that had no place in the original plan of things, but which has gradually come to have a dominant value uh, in social problems, largely from ambition and economic factors. So here today, we're more or less here to pay honor uh, to what is probably the world's most important single symbol, and that symbol is maternity. It is the symbol of that without which all things end, that which, if disregarded or perverted, destroys civilization. The fate of the world and the future of humanity, whether we realize it or not, is essentially in the keeping of women. Men can help them. Men can take from them certain labors that are difficult. But the ideals and principles of progress are feminine, and as such must be allowed to mature and develop, and the women themselves must recognize the divine birthright which they have, respect it, honor it, and live up to it. Because in this they have a uniqueness that nature has ordained and for which the individual himself can no longer be held directly responsible, but for which all beings must labor together. Today we are in the presence of a great tragedy of conflict and difficulty and militarism. We are in the presence of every type of antagonism. We are in the presence of a situation in which unless something comes along to change the general poise of things, the whole structure of civilization is endangered. The, the future of our children is endangered. And all the, the privileges which we have earned with pain and sorrow will be taken away. So we have to consider very definitely the problem of protecting the great basic triad of laws upon which we live. And there's no way of breaking these laws. There's no way of uh, evading the responsibility. And uh, remember that in the Platonic Dialogues uh, that we have the uh, Plato in his older years, after uh, he had uh, more or less retired from public life, teaching a few of his better disciples, including his nephew Spusippus, that all wisdom has its as its end only one thing. Wisdom helps us to love and keep the faith. There is nothing in wisdom that can save us, but it can be make us aware of something superior to itself. Education is not going to save us, no matter how many universities we build. Of something superior to itself. Education is not going to save us, no matter how many universities we build. But there is something in the university that can help us to outgrow the university. And that is the thing we are greatly concerned with. We have today great schools of science. We have a new age of computers that is already short-circuiting itself. We have all kinds of advancements that we boast of, including munitions. But none of these things have any permanent value and have no foundation in truth. The truth of the matter is that all material things exist for two purposes alone, the basic purpose being to preserve the continuity of material existence and the second to outgrow it. And without these two working together, we're in very bad shape. Now, to get the thing back on its feet again, we have to restore the concept that the great moving power of creation, as we know it, is love. Without love, nothing will work. Without love, true love, nothing can be truly accomplished. And what we have generally regarded as affection or love 
is for the most part too diluted, too weak, and too inadequate to fulfill its own purpose. Therefore, the only basis of international understanding is mutual affection. The only way of preventing divorces from running away with mankind is affection. An affection, of course, based upon a certain experience. The uh, things that happen to us are intended to be a continuing, unrolling scroll of learning. Every day we learn something. And now, every day that we learn something, we promptly forget anything we don't want to know or never bother to take consideration of it. We are working on a mental level, and this mental level is getting us into one difficulty after another because the mind is useless unless it is warmed by the love principle within it. With wisdom without love is fallacy. Strength without compassion is fallacy. Learning without love or without leading to a greater faith in realities is empty. There's nothing to it. And we are living on this surface of this emptiness every day of our lives and trying to make it seem as though it was important and useful. So if in the next few years, which it seems quite reasonable, there will be a continual unfolding of the significance of the feminine principle in life, that it is going to be restored to the dignities which it once held for long periods of time until the human being became too intellectual and lost contact with reality. This means also, however, that the ad advancement of the feminine part of society depends upon some thoughtfulness, some consideration, and some realization of significance. Instead of assuming that this can be accomplished by the uh, woman taking on the mental attitudes of the man, it is not going to work. Because if it worked for, if it worked for her, it would have worked for him, and it didn't. The more she becomes a man, in thinking and living and competing, the more certain she is to, lay, to contribute to the common ruin. This is not her province. Her province is not to copy, but to originate. It's not to do what has been done by men, but to do what only a woman could do, has done, and can do again. It is a tremendous challenge in which a half of human life has become aware, or is becoming aware, of its absolutely indispensable part in survival. That it actually, that the survival of humanity rests firmly upon the feminine phase of the human race. Now this means we've got to do something to try to point out these values and not allow them to be drifted along until it is too late to use their emphasis. It should be definite that actually every opportunity should be given and taken to acquaint the, the, woman of the women of the world with their spiritual responsibilities and opportunities, their social leadership, and even their political leadership, a political leadership which perhaps like the League of the Iroquois permits them to appoint their representatives or be their representatives themselves. But the main problem is to keep the heart power dominant. Love and love alone can solve this problem. Nothing else can. Faith can be strengthened by love, and love can strengthen faith. Peace can be aroused by faith or become apparent through love and through kindness. Kindness was uh, a very great power in ancient thinking, and we now consider it largely as a feminine virtue. But kindness is, according to Buddhism, is the next world teacher. The next world teacher is the Bodhisattva Maitreya, and the word Maitreya means kind or kindness. And it looks awfully much as though there is something very deep and mysterious in this ancient concept that was given to the world over 2,000 years ago, that the universal savior of the future must be kindness. 
power, skill, war, no. But a kindness which causes the individual to have an enduring sympathy for the needy. Kindness which means to turn away all wrath. Kindness which means to be ever aware of the needs of each other and ever forgiving of each other and ever mindful of our own need for improvement. All of these things sum up into what we might term a feminine dominance. Now this feminine dominance can to some degree certainly be shared equally by all men because a man has perfect capacity to be kind if he wants to. He can be thoughtful. He can be affectionate. He can be uh, considerate. He can be a good parent, a good marriage partner, and a good child. These things are not denied him in any sense of the word. He is perfectly capable of defending the best things in life. But when they come along and there is a challenge and there is a matter which requires or is assumed to require masculine prerogatives, let him forever remember that it is love in him that must solve, that it is not the privilege of the man to go out and fight. It is not even his need to fight for the defense of a woman, because if man and women come to their proper relationship, there is no longer a conflict. Each one supports the other in its needs and fulfillments and does everything possible to advance the common good. So it's natural that the maternal instinct, which we all recognize, and which goes on through life in most cases, parents are thoughtful of their children for the most part throughout all the years of life. But in some mysterious way, life has crippled many of them. They are disillusioned. They are hurt. They have had uh, disappointments. They have been betrayed in many respects and ways and outraged. But there is still the great necessity are starting somewhere to put the thing back in order. And the place that is uh, that may all things have to begin is in the cradle. The beginning of the reformation of the world will not come from the top. It will not come from the great treaties which will be made and broken before the ink is dry. The great changes for the future begin in the cradle. They begin with a new relationship and a new understanding between child and parent. A bringing up of the child in a present atmosphere, one of control, discipline, and affection. A parent actually able, through knowledge and insight, to bring to the child everything possible to enable it to become a law-abiding, lawful, and intelligent citizen. While these processes are on, the uh, elders of the tribe, so to say, will go on with their lawmaking and do the best they can, probably, to bring some kind of cosmos out of this chaos. But in the long run, it is a gentle, kindly, continuing strength of principles and ideals that must bring us through. We will never be able to find a peace that results from war we will find a peace that results from the spreading of the peace in the human heart and also a peace that is prescribed and recommended and ordered by practically every religion of the world. These things also bear in mind the fact that from the earliest time religion has been primarily invested in women. Religion has become their instrument and in uh, Christianity the number of canonized women is very considerable. And uh, many symbols and articles are related to women. The robes of the Sibyls become the garments of the cardinals. And the, uh, the cardinals and the higher officials nearly always wear robes that are suggestive of the women of, in, of antiquity who were the oracles and the custodians of wisdom. So the churches, the mosques and the synagogues and the temples and the chapels and the shrines all have the same essential principle to work with. In every case, God has so loved humanity that it gave its only begotten Son to save the world. And that love of God is the mother 
of humanity. It is that love which is expressed and exemplified. Without that love, the act of creation would be sterile. But divinity has given the power of love to control all things, and the divinity itself is an androgynous unity. It is mother-father. It has to be both. It cannot be either alone. It is a power which is divided in us, but was a uni unity in the beginning, and must again ultimately be unified in creation. Everything in the end must be governed by perfect wisdom, re resulting in perfect love. All these things we sort of realize now, and we are reaching out and feeling for them in times of trouble, and wondering if something can be done about it. But I think something can be done about it, but it's going to take a little thought. And I think among the things it's going to take will be a very definite uh, acceptance by women of their divine birthright, of the right that they have to be, have a, mar a marvelous and protective power in the form of their leadership of mankind. Actually, as has been made many comic remarks about it, the average man is a rather helpless creature at best, and he's getting more so every day. He is becoming hopelessly involved in world affairs. He's trying to get a job and keep it. He is being pushed around by mechanization. He is being uh, uh, unemployed uh, through the corruptions of our economic system. He is a perturbed and disturbed creature. And he, in turn, needs a certain amount of insights. He has got to also find that in his heart and soul there is only one thing that will ever bring him any peace, and that is that he will be able to put his own life in order, that he will be able to be the person that he would want to be if he could be. And to do this, he all, all he can do at the present time is to become a proper spirit in his own family, that he can share the responsibilities of that family, contribute in every way that he can to leadership in his own field, and to support the maternal growth of spiritual values in family life. He has to, the only things he can do at the moment, uh, really, basically, is to have faith in a divine power and to have love for all he knows and all that he can do to help those for whom he has responsibility. These things he can do, but in some mysterious way, the gates of intuition, the mysterious power of leadership, is best developed in the feminine nature. Now, how would a woman go about to strengthen this particular factor in her own life? It becomes obvious that if she simply becomes a, a companion to a materialist, this is not going to do it. It also follows that if she follows with all the ambitions and, and uh, economic pressures that she has already carried, if she also is very success-centered, wants all the physical things that she can have, and things of this kind, something has to be sacrificed. And this sacrifice has been going on for a long time, and it's produced nothing. The, the main thing that the woman has to do is become better informed about the universal plan and the laws that govern it, to realize that her, her dignity in it has been neglected, that her conscious active participation in the fulfillment of the universal mystery has been uh, passed over too lightly. There is a responsibility in her that no man can ever carry. There is a responsibility in her that if she does not carry it, all humanity will suffer. Therefore, it is most important that her power be protected, that her vision be clarified, and that the true principle of compassion will guide her in her daily labors. This compassion will rub off. It will rub off internationally, interracially. Once people begin to think in terms of a natural respect for each other, the whole history of the world will change. Now, 50% or more, a little more than 50% from the recent statistics, of the population of the earth is women. 
These women represent probably close to three billion human beings. These three billion human beings possess an internal sensitivity they are born with. They are naturally closer to life than men. They are naturally more involved in the mysteries of generation and regeneration than men. Their entire equipment fits them to make the greatest contribution to progress of either sex, and they are outnumbering men and are gradually gaining greater and greater recognition in every field. If over half the population instinctively, internally wants peace, actually realizes the danger of war, feels in its own heart the pain and suffering and misery of comp competition and destruction. If over half the world wants peace and is founded in a philosophy of love and faith, is actually endowed with a mercy beyond that of the opposite sex. If this is true, the, such the situation can be solved. There is no reason why that part of life which carries its greatest ideals should be powerless to take any positive effect in the situation. It is perfectly possible for women to end war. They can do it if they want to, because they have the majority. And they also have intangible psychological forms and instruments of achievement, which men do not have. They also have the possibility of visualizing and dreaming from within themselves, especially in the hours and days in which they are carrying life in their own bodies. They can dream of a world better than anything we know. And with over three billion of them to do it, why is it so slow? Why is all this not being done? Is it because women have not as high an estimation of themselves as men have of them? Is it because for some unknown reason they believe that love and faith are not strong enough to take care of hate? Do they believe that religion is too weak to work against economics and competition? Are they so uh, uh, structured that they believe that they can live in comparative peace with maybe a half of the world hungry? And what are these things that are retarding the most powerful force we have in the world today? A force that has been neglected, a force that has not been brought into focus, a force against which almost every vice we know would have to fall. This is something that seems to be very needed. And it's very possible that the, the present trend, which is definitely a feministic trend, has this at the root of itself. This is the, the fact that can be and restored as it was of old. Five thousand years ago, women ruled the world and ruled nearly every institution of mankind. Now they have difficulty ruling anything, including themselves. It cannot go on like this. Here we have not a treaty, not somebody signing a pledge, not a group of people meeting to try to outlaw difficulties between Ethiopia and some other country. We have a tremendous force internally aware of the great need of love, internally aware of the importance of peace, internally aware of the fact that it does not want its sons to go to war and die. It does not want its daughters uh, to fall into negative patterns that have no permanent value. These people can and should be the leaders of tomorrow. They should help us to make peaceful the lands in which we live. And our education for young women today should definitely include very definite training in idealism, integrities, and the highest form of the recognition of the dignity of themselves. That they are not second-rate citizens and never were. They have always 
invisibly, visibly, or psychologically rule the world. Now the time comes for them to unite to make certain that a better world goes on than we have had up to the present time. It is largely in their keeping. Some will say men have failed. Well, probably they have. The failure of men is bad, but the failure of woman is worse. Because with her, if she fails, all hope for security, peace, and ultimate intelligent conduct all go together. So it is very necessary today for every person to try either to increase insights, increase understanding, or increase faith, and to become more and more capable of handling all these little irritating, nagging things which have divided people for so long. This is no time for division. This is time for unity. The unity of effort. And I think we will find that when it is placed on the proper level, we're going to get a great deal of cooperation. Both men and women are willing and can work together. They can build together. If they have dreams, they can dream together. And there's a very poor man, indeed, who will not rise to his wife's dreams if she makes them clear and honest. We can also do much in the making of public opinion. We can become individually more expressive of the values we believe in. We can do much to change the entertainment field. We can do much to change the literary field of the moment. We can get the degeneracy out of our modern way of life if we want to. And the power to do that is in the understanding woman who knows what it means to do it wrong and who also has the power always to correct the faults of her own kind and also the faults of men. These points are coming up. We are getting very close to the time when some of these facts are going to have to be faced. We are now at a time when every situation that we know of has come to a dead end. We are not getting anywhere. Now, we are not going to achieve this by simply electing women to a public office. They are entitled to it. No one doubts it. But that's not going to answer it if they keep on running the way the men ran it. We're going to be right where we were. So the effort of a woman to succeed by being liking, like a man is a dead loss to her and to the world. She has got to do the thing that she alone can do, and that is dignify the internal values of life. She is the one who must emphasize those basic spiritual values which are the substance of religion. Well, men talk about religion, and a lot of them try hard to live according to it. Religion is probably the most powerful force in the life of woman. But this religion cannot be sectarian. It cannot be competitive or combative. It can't be constantly involved in internal strife and struggle. Religion must be the internal awareness of all, of all people of the rules of the game. It must be the recognition of the essential reason for being here, and that is to come to understand the power that put us here, the reason for being here, and how we can fulfill the unfinished business of the ages. With this type of thinking, we're going to get somewhere. We're going to find that a unique contribution will come in and as we think back over history and study the matter, we will realize that wherever that contribution appeared even for a little while, it made a unique improvement in humankind. It was a tremendous constructive force. But in the course of time and the rising of material ambitions and material aspirations, the essentials have been forgotten. But here we come... And uh, I think Nostradamus was one of the prophets who pointed out that near the end of the present century there must be a great and major change. That it may be preceded by a great cataclysm of some kind. Maybe not. He hoped it wouldn't be. But the world wasn't going to end. 
because he says that at the beginning of the 21st century the paraclete will come. Now the word paraclete means the peaceful. There is going to be a resurgent of, in, of uh, life in which the divine plan and the divine purpose will be restored. It will be a time when all governments and all ways of life will begin to pay honor and tribute to the immutable principles upon which existence stands. And at that time, the Prince of Peace, or the Princes of Peace, may come. But whatever it is, the great change is one thing and one thing only. It is the change, the shift, from fear to faith, from hate to love, and from error to truth. We cannot build on any other foundation. And of all the values that we have that we need most, these values are associated particularly with women. They have always been hymned and sung in these respects. They have been worshipped in a strange way, generation after generation, by men who never understood them. But they have still been held and are still regarded as the most powerful force in the world. Now, the problem is to try to use that force without going, let going to the heads and making them the new conquerors. This won't do. The new thing is very great, namely, that the love of life, the love of the divine, the love of realities and truths will conquer them. And they will live peacefully, happily, successfully, and with all the needs of life because they have put the world into a better order to carry on its duties and responsibilities. There is this point which I think we need to basically remember, that there is a purpose of things as they are. The old story of Adam and Eve had a meaning, and that meaning has got to be gradually restored. The interpretation given in the popular mind is not the true meaning. The true meaning is that these two together, representing a unit, uh, the Adam and Eve being the two divisions of human life, not people, the, the great divisions of human life, that from generation to generation got into trouble, must come back again as the great progenitors who will lead the way to once more into the garden of the Lord. This world is a garden. It should be a garden. Women love gardens. They love to raise flowers and a few vegetables and a little fruit now and then. They enjoy it. This whole world is a garden. And if we stop wrecking it, we can have it. But we have gotten into the habit of watching it for a minute and then selling it off for a profit. We have definitely sold our birthrights for bowls of pottage. We have done everything for profit and not for principle. We have failed to realize that the greatest profit arises from principle. Now all these natural virtues, being so sanctionally feminine, and being so recognized by both men, that they are the great leaders of life, the things that make life worthwhile, make living not an accident or a disaster, but a friendship and companionship and comradeship down through the years. The realization of this, if applied and expanded, can end forever the problems of war and hate and crime. There is no reason why utopia shouldn't be a reality. There is no reason why people who can educate themselves into all the skills that we have cannot further that education until they reach the condition where they can live together in peace. All these things are coming, and when the times and decisions arise, it's be wonderful to know that we get a solid vote of confidence uh, from the women of the world, and that they're going to stand up and say, this is the way it must be. Not because we order it that way, not because we're going to carry the munitions or going to get hold of the bombs, but because there is something stronger than, every, than all these things. And that is simply love. And that is the particular power with which women have been endowed by the universe and by God. 
And by using it, they will discover that the love of God is the love for God, and that all together we are one creation, trying to think it through from a man's standpoint, trying to feel it through from a woman's standpoint. Bring the thought and feeling together, and we got something. But while we leave them divided the way they are, they're all land in the divorce court. This should not be. So on this particular occasion of Mother's Day, it would seem to be appropriate to say that we are all going to pull together to see that whether men or women, we cannot exemplify the great virtues of womanhood, faith, love, kindness, and sympathy. If we can both, men and women, develop these factors, we will have a world in which wisdom is balanced with love, where strength is balanced by mercy. And these two factors, forever working together in harmony, will give us that golden time we look for. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you.